Eternal truth will neither be true nor eternal unless they have fresh meaning for every generation and for every new social situation. Eternal truths will neither be true nor eternal unless they have fresh meaning for every generation and for every new social situation. This is the import of Romans chapter 15 verse 4 to 6 and 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 11. For Romans 15, 4 to 6, I'm getting you ready. Mm. Romans 15, 4 to 6, for whatever things were written before were written for that generation. No, they were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are going to receive consolation today, comfort of the Holy Spirit, and you will declare a word, it will not fall to the ground. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you read it in 1 Corinthians 10, you are finding the same things. The things that were written before. All those men that it happened, they were examples unto us, unto whom the end of the age had come. Now sit down and let me teach you what, how to apply eternal truths. Hold on for me a little. Except we know these eternal truths and are grounded in them, we cannot execute the judgment written by God. Except you know these eternal truths, you are grounded in them and guided by them, you will fight as one that beats the air. How many vigils have been going on in our land for years now? They have pronounced some people dead already, but the people they pronounce dead are attending their funerals. And they are not trying to find out and say, wait a minute, we must be doing some things wrong. Except we embrace these eternal truths, we are grounded in them, and we are guided by them. We will fight as one that beats the air. Our word will fall to the ground unfulfilled, and we will not be able to execute the judgment that is written. Let me give you two examples, one from the Old Testament and one from the New how to execute the judgment that is written. Give me 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 1. 1 Kings 17, 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, who, who was Ahab? The king of Israel said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel rules or lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Now, won't you say this man was full of himself? He was standing before the king of Israel and he had the audacity to declare in his presence that Ahab, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, there shall be no rain or dew in this land these years. He did not specify. Because he wasn't sure how long it will last. Hello. Okay, I'm not sure you hear me. He wasn't sure how long it will last. These years, it simply means it will not be one. It will at least be true. Except at my word. I want to remind you that it did not say, Thus said the Lord. Hallelujah. This is why it's important for you to carry command, to know how to carry command. And then in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah when? Abba. The word of the Lord came to Elijah when? In the third year 
saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Who is the father of rain? Who is going to send rain? Who will stop rain from falling? There you go. Elijah, God. Elijah was merely executing the judgment that is written. I'm going to show it to you in black and white so that you gain understanding that we just don't come here to fight a hopeless world and to declare nonsense. Just open our mouth and gas is coming out. No. That's not the way to go. You don't come and announce to a nation that's about to conduct an election that both parties will fail, one will fail, one will lose. You must be mad to declare that. It's when it comes to pass, they'll say, wait a minute. It must have been in the presence of the Lord. Now, in, in 1 Kings 17, he said, there shall be no rain or dew in this land except at my word. Then James chapter 5 said, Elisha, let's go there. Give me James 5, 17 to 18. I want you to see it. Because you don't know what power you have and those who know don't know how to exercise them. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was a man of like passion. That is, Elijah was not a god. He was not just a goddess, if you like. He was a man like you and I. The difference is the presence of God with him. Joseph was like any other prisoner. But the presence of the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph was like any other staff of Potiphar. But the presence of the Lord distinguished him. May the presence of God distinguish you from the park. In the mighty, that's all. That's all I have. The presence of God in my life is my wealth. And the presence of God was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. Let God remove his hand from my life. I will be wasted in split seconds. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that he would not reign. Look, was Elijah sure of his declaration? <laughs> Why was he praying that he would not reign? After he had said, there shall be no rain or dew. He knew he was just merely executing the judgment. I was reading. What is that judgment? Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass. That would take me a whole day to explain during Dominion Partners Conference. Because you pay tight and yet you're still broke. You give offering and yet nothing is happening. Because you do not know what existed before now it shall come to pass. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. One of those blessings, verse 9 to 12, one of those blessings... The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. You're not going to struggle to live holy. He will grant you grace. He will establish you a holy people to himself. Just as he has won to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods and the fruit of your body. In the increase of your livestock, I hope you are hearing the generation that just want to have one son and that's all. The Lord will grant you increase in the fruit of your body, in the, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground. You know, people say things to me, you know, the, the economy of this world is so bad, nobody should have more than one child of maximum two in these days. Who said? The economy of the world or the economy of heaven? Now asking you to go and raise children that you cannot nurse. Now, I knew I would have five before the first one came. And I told my wife, we are going to have five children. We only disagree on one score. I wanted five girls. He want, she wanted boys and girls. And she won. Thank you. <laughs> she won. 
And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods and the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and the produce of your ground and the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you watch days. Next verse. The Lord will open to you his good treasure. Where is his good treasure? The heavens. To give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. What kind of rain is this that blesses the work of your hand? It's the rain of his word. As rain comes down from heaven and the snow and does not return there, so shall be my word. It will not return to me void. It will give you direction. It will give you a word that you run with. It will bless the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. See the reverse in Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments. Please pay attention. And his statutes which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Both are set in motion. Blessings and curses. Verses 23 and 24. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze. And the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Now this was a judgment that was written that Elijah executed and said, there shall be no rain nor dew upon this land for these years except at my word. Now, what preceded that will show you why that judgment was executed. 1 Kings 16 came before 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 16, verse 29. I'll read up to verse 33. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, it was him that he told there shall be no rain or dew. Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebah, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Abel. King of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. You see, the king of Sidonians was the high priest of Baal. And Ahab went and took the daughter and the lamb as wife and the lamb became defiled. The moment Elijah saw that, he said, let me show who is in charge. There shall be no rain, no dew. Call your, uh, metro, what do you call the metrologist? Call all of them and find out that there's one who rules in the affairs of men. There shall be no rain nor dew in this land except at my word. He executed the judgment that was written and God backed him up. Example in the New Testament. Acts 13. Let me start from about verse Three, they prayed for them, they laid hands on them. This is Barnabas and Saul. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. They were to start their mission. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, who sent them out? The Holy Spirit. They went down to Silesia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island... To Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, a low, <laughs> whose name was Bar Jesus, and who was with who? Proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, an intelligent man surrounded by a voodoo priest, a voodoo Jew, a voodoo priest who was a Jew. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimaz the sorcerer, for so is his name, his name is translated. We stood them seeking to turn the proconsul pro away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, fool of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. 
And immediately darkness fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed belief when he saw what had been done. Being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Paul was executing the judgment. I was written there. Jesus said, for this purpose came I to the world. That those who have eyes will not see. And those who are blind will see. Do you understand me? He was merely filled with the Holy Spirit. He executed a judgment that turned the proconsul to the Lord and elements the sorcerer had to be led away. Now, who may execute the judgment that is written? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Who? Psalm 149, verse 5 to 9. Who may execute the judgment that is written? Psalm 149, verse 5 to 9. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. So you, mu you must have something going on when you are singing aloud on your bed. You understand? Not just humming it. You have some confidence that your environment can't understand. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. This is militant praise. And a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. These honor have apostles. These honor have prophets. These honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Do I have God's saints in the house this morning? Stand to your feet and begin to bless his holy name for the precious sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, for the blood that was shed for your sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We thank you, our Father, our God. We know there is a judgment written. And we as your people, at a appointed time when your leaders can come and execute just such judgment upon the nations of the earth, upon the kings and the nobles, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters. This privilege has all the saints. You may be seated. I pray I'm able to finish this today. If I'm not, we'll continue till I finish it. Because I want you to be grounded in this eternal truth. Eternal truth number one. Where the prince of peace does not reign, there cannot be peace. Say that with me. I'm not saying where there is no religion. I'm saying where the prince of peace does not reign, there cannot be peace. Psalm 85, verse number 4. Psalm 85, verse number 4. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. How many people are willing to hear today? I will hear what God the Lord will speak for. He will speak peace to his people and to his saints but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in a land. Mercy and truth have met together. A council is taking place in heaven right now. These are the four winds of heaven about to meet and about to kiss, and they're about to cause things to begin to happen on the face of the earth. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. What's going to happen when that happens? Truth shall spring out of the earth. Righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good. And our land will yield what? Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our way. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Now, a child is not a son. 
to produce a son to God thirty years. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be where? Upon his shoulder. Is the shoulder the head? Who is the head of the church? Who is the body of Christ? Where is the shoulder located? You have been running away from responsibility. That's why we have mess in our land. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, our Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. Peace is the foundation of increase. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even for how long? Forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. All the seven attributes of good governance is in that scripture I read. Peace, increase, order, judgment, justice. Do you understand me? And zeal, patriotism, all the attributes of good government are there. But we are not exploring them. We are not establishing them. We are not grounded in those truths. Because of that, we are not experiencing peace in our nation. No nation can experience true peace without the prince of peace. For those who care to know, it was at the birth of the Messiah that the angel who made the announcement, alongside with a multitude of the heavenly hosts, made a proclamation of peace to all men. For the first time, there have been wars and counter wars, but the moment Jesus was born, angelic hosts began to sing and they announced peace, goodwill to all men. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. From that text of scripture, I want to establish three major things that will cause you to pray like you never prayed before. There's going to be peace like a river in this country. And how would you know? All our high fences will start coming down. You don't understand that. You do not know that we're leaving maximum Kirikiri prisons, all of us. Your fences are so high. I, I trust God that there will be no fire in the hallway of your bedroom. Because the security door, before you open it, it will be too late. There are many of you, there are so many security doors before they get to you. Do you understand me? But in case of fire, you have not thought of escape route. <laughs> okay. If you want to, information on how to build, come and see me. I will not charge you. I'll show you how to build in such a way that if disaster hits from this place, there's exit here. And if it hits from that place, you can always escape. It's called architecture from heaven. <laughs> Give me Luke chapter 2. Very simple truths, but eternal truth. It came to pass in those days... That the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. I have a question for you. Who made this decree? This decree? Caesar Augustus. He was the ruler of the world. He was the ruler of the empire, like the British Empire. This was a bigger empire than the British Empire. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Caesar Augustus decreed that all the world should be numbered. For what reason? It could be for just purposes of censors, or for purposes of taxation, or it can be also for purposes of planning on how to deliver dividends of dictatorship. <laughs> there was no democracy there. To the people. It could be for one reason or the other. Number them, count them. They did everything. That was what Augustus Caesar was doing. But what was the plan of heaven? Mary and Joseph must get to Bethlehem. Because that's where Jesus must be born. 
I'm not sure you're hearing me. You can go read the entire story. The hearts of kings are in the hands of the Lord and like the rivers of water, it directs their heart the way it chooses. It just got up and said, begin to number people. Now listen to this. That this will happen was already acted out before Caesar Augustus was born. There was a man by the name of Jacob who was married to Rachel. And suddenly the Lord said, go to Bethel where you anointed the pillar. He went there. But then he journeyed from Bethel. Everything is not going to end inside the building. There must be a journey out of Bethel into Bethlehem before there can be plenty of bread for people. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. It was a five mile journey. But his wife was heavy. Why couldn't he just wait in Bethel and let his child be born in Bethel? Because God has planned and purpose that this child must be born in Bethlehem. So, Caesar Augustus issued the decree. He didn't know. Now look at Jacob. Jacob began to go on the journey and something happened. Rachel was in labor. And it was a hard labor. And as was given birth to that last child, somebody say last child. Last child. And second son, somebody say second son. Second son. You're not responding to me. Second. Who was Benjamin? Last child. What was his position in the life of Rachel? Second son of Rachel. <laughs> Who is coming as king of kings and lord of lords? The last Adam. Second man from heaven. So we have to determine where he will be born. That was the reason for leaving Bethel for Bethlehem. On the way, the, child, the mother died, the child lived. And as was breathing at last, she named the child Benoni, son of my sorrow. And for the first time of all the 12 sons, Jacob got up and said, no, he shall be called Benjamin, son of my right hand. Who is son of sorrow acquainted with grief? Jesus. Who is sitting now on the right hand side of the father? Jesus. Therefore, where Benjamin was born is where Jesus will be born. To make it happen, Caesar issued a decree. Well, I'm not sure you're getting me. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, whenever you see strange decrees, Strange orders happening. Don't begin to use your mouth anyhow. Because look at me. What has Twitter got to do with the trouble of our nation? With the many troubles we have. Is Twitter going to ban terrorism? Kidnapping? But when you see those things, don't quickly take the gauntlet and begin to fight. Pull back. Heaven, you are doing something. A decree has just been issued. What do you want to accomplish? Do you understand me? Or you become a social commentator. A reactionary reacting to every little thing. And I'm not boasting on, on anything that I should not boast about. We already fixed this matter behind the scene. I've told you should listen. This is not in your best interest. This is distraction. 40 million people are on that platform. You don't need to turn the youth of this nation against you in rebellion. Let them be the one fighting your battles. Call this off. But when decrees are issued and you do not know the plan and purpose of God, you begin to fight what should work for you. <laughs> mm. Do you know how long Jesus lived for in Bethlehem? You've not been reading your Bible. Okay, give me Luke. Let's find out for how long. No, it's Matthew. Matthew chapter 2. How long did he live for there? He was born there. He was not raised there. He was raised where? In Nazareth. How long did he live for in Bethlehem? Matthew chapter 2. 
Now, after Jesus was born where? In Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod, heard, the king, heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and all the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So it has been written before it happened. Then Aaron, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Now this is how you will find out how long Jesus lived in Bethlehem. How long did he live there for? The moment the wise men did not return to him, because angel of the Lord warned them after they had seen Jesus and worshipped him, they did not return. Herod became furious. What did he say next? Go and kill every child from age two under. So he lived there for two years. Yeah. But what was the problem? Why the killing? Because again, it was prophesied. <laughs> Lord, have mercy upon me. And he said to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Give me where he ordered them to be killed. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all his district from two years old and under. Why? According to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You go back into the, into the prophecy of Jeremiah and you see the circumstances. And then you begin to understand why they had to be killed. You know, an elderly man, I won't mention names here, one of the chieftains in, in Yoruba asked me, he said, all these killings, all these killings, pastor, what do you say to it? This is too much. I said, I will tell you what Jesus said to the people who came to him. He said to him, Herod has mixed the blood of Galileans with his sacrifice. Or is he pined And he looked at them, he said, except you repent, you also will likewise perish. And then the same great man said to me, Look, all people surrounding me, I, don't, I can't even vouch for them. I don't even trust them. I don't even know what to do now. I said, let me tell you the truth. Everybody that followed Jesus was like that. One sold him, betrayed him. Another one denied him. All of them fled in the day of crisis. What you need is to get the Holy Spirit into them. Are you born again, Baba? Let's become the blind that leads the blind. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to navigate this terrain. Now people are dying left, right, and center. It should not cause you to be, now come, become downcast and lose hope and say that everything is all against us. Give me Jeremiah. I want to open fire. Jeremiah 31, verse 10 to 17. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming, are you on live stream today? Streaming, God knows you will stream, streaming to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be like a well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and all together. For I will turn their money to joy. Can I hear amen in this house? Amen. I will turn their money to joy and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. Can I hear amen? amen. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Here we go. 
Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah. Jeremiah did not even fully understand what he was prophesying because it would not happen until the day of Jesus. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. You go to the families of those who have been kidnapped. Some who had met them would tell you they were in agony, they were in grief. Some of them came on television, they don't understand. But I come to announce to you that their death will not be in vain. In the mighty name of Jesus, thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. Don't stop there, there is hope. In your future. Amen. Says the Lord. That your children shall come back to their own border. Say to your neighbor. There is hope in your future. And there is future in that hope. Say personalize. There is hope in my future. Hope that does not disappoint. Hope that does not waste away. I'm hoping against hope today. But there is hope in my future. And there is future in that hope. Now. I want to share some things with you so that you are grounded in this because the Prince of Peace is ruling and living on the inside of you. Regardless of who issues a decree, whether it's by Twitter, it's on Twitter, or on what other Twitter handle, or on social, what's it? Facebook, that's my social media director. Huh? Huh? Instagram. I understand there's another one called Ku. That young people had moved on to Ku. And it's going, oh, oh. I've not, I'm not seen that. And I'm not interested. Whether it's what, if there are such decrees behind the decree, there is something more. You want to know what it is? Hmm? From now on, as the decree of Caesar, Augustus, Enable Jesus to be born in the place of destiny. It doesn't matter who issues what decree. All things will work together for your good. Stand to your feet and begin. All things will work together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for them. <laughs> for the good of them that love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. This day, Father, in the name of Jesus, I position myself on eternal truth that all decrees, all decrees, all laws, whatever is the aim or the purpose or the reasoning of those behind it, they will work for me. They will work for your church, not against your church. In the mighty name of Jesus, all things will work for my good. In Jesus' mighty name, all things, all things will work for my good. In Jesus' mighty name. Number two, my work will be rewarded. The Lord will reward me. I'm not looking onto the hills, I'm looking unto God. I want you to pray, Lord, reward me according to my righteousness, according to my, my faith. Reward me this day with your presence, with your power, with your prominence, with your promotion, with your provision. My work shall be rewarded by the Lord. That was a prophecy of Jeremiah. Yes, there's death on the right. Yes, there's death on the left. Those people will not die in vain. Our work shall be rewarded by the Lord, provided we are not looking unto the hills, but we are looking unto God, the rewarder of those who diligently seek them. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. There is a definite hope in the future of this nation. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, I know the thought that I think towards you. The thought of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. In the name of Jesus Christ, there is a definite hope in our future. Amen. Now, the reason I read the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ was because in Luke chapter 2, the angel that showed up to the shepherd said, Peace on earth, goodwill. Toward men. Say that with me. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. I can't hear you well. Is Nigeria part of the earth? 
And when God says peace on earth, what's going to happen to Nigeria? But you know what Jesus said? When you get to a place and you don't find the children of peace, your peace will follow you. Are there sons of peace in this house today? You are carrying that peace like a river everywhere you go. There will be peace in our land like a river in the name of Jesus. You are the carriers of that peace and you are going to take them to your nooks and cranny, to your home, to your places of assignment in the name of Jesus. Without increase and widely shared prosperity, our economy will be ransom economy. Our young people who are deprived and who are facing excruciating want will take laws into their hands and will begin to maim and kill and rape and demand ransom for those who are able to capture. Listen to me in the name of Jesus Christ. That is going to change. I want you to declare peace. Release peace upon our land. Release peace upon our forest today. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> I thank you my father and my God. I thank you for peace and abundance of it. This day in Jesus name. I thank you for bringing forth your peace. Into our forests. Into the nooks and crannies. In our highways. In the name of Jesus Nigeria will experience peace. Nigeria will know peace. You will take away the sons of, of, of riot, the sons of war, away from our land. This rebellious bunch that are causing this trouble and those who are sponsoring them, who are sponsoring cold blood murder on our highways, kidnapping and all kinds of, of terrible things. In Jesus' mighty name, sweep them off, blow over them, let your let your wind carry them away and their sponsors in the mighty name of Jesus. Let there be peace in our land. In Jesus' mighty name. Everything you are hearing with your ears today, your eyes will see. Amen. Nigeria will become a land of peace. Amen. A land of plenty. Amen. A land of increase. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Be seated. Eternal truth number two. Eternal truth number two. Error breeds terror. Say that with me. I can't hear you. The root cause of error or terror in any nation is the perpetration of error by the leaders of that nation and their followers. Where there's no error, there will be no terror. If you're looking at terrorists and calling them names, look in the mirror. Are you part of the blunder? What is your role in what is going on? Are you an encourager of terrorists? Of killer hatsmen carrying AK-47? Where there's no error, there'll be no terror. The root cause of terror is a perpetration of error by the leaders. It is when people turn against God that he also turns against them. Give me Leviticus 26. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of God for it. Leviticus 26 verse 3. Leviticus 26 verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your treasure shall last to the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last to the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land. How? Safely. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the soul will not go through your land. Can I hear? Amen. Amen. Well, let's compare that with verse 14. Leviticus 26, 14 to 17. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgment, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, what will happen? I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you. Wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall Eat it. I will set my face against you and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when no one pursues you. 
That's a problem of Nigeria, critical compound problem, that those who are supposed to be leading us, they hate this nation. They hate us as a people. Or why will you divert what belongs to the people into your private purses? Why will you have estates at the expense of the nation? Why will you just grab everything inside? And then terror responds and comes. Who empowered Boko Haram? How did he start? Did he just jump on us? Was, not, was he not a governor that empowered young people and used them as, as gangs and they killed their leaders and they turned against them? What's the root of, of Boko Haram? How did he start? Those who are engineered and perpetrated are walking free. Look at the carnage in our land today. When leaders are in error, they will breed terror. But if the perpetrators of that evil will humble themselves and confess their iniquities, God will bring an end to the terror ravaging the land. And it will usher in tremendous peace into their land. Leviticus 26, 40 to 42. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their unfaithfulness and which they were unfaithful to me, and they, that they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if they are uncircumcised and humbled, and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. It was in KIV, keeping view, suspended for a while. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, I will remember the land. I want you to stand upon your feet and say, Lord, remember Nigeria. For the sake of the elect, remember Nigeria today. For the sake of the elect, remember Nigeria. We confess the blunders of our leaders. We stand as intercessors between you and them. We ask for mercy upon this nation today. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, help us. Help our nation. Help us. Remember our land. Remember what the founding fathers agreed as to the system of governance in this country. How, we, after much ado, they came to agree there will be a federal republic of Nigeria with each region or each state having its own resources, being able to determine its own destiny, going at its own pace, the founding fathers agreed to 1963 constitution and it became the ground norm for our land until the wasters came, until the years of the locusts that they imposed an impossible, difficult, mismatched constitution upon us. Remember this nation and give wisdom to our leaders to do what is needful on time. Remember our land, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The point in history at which we stand today is full of promise and danger. Right now in Nigeria, the point at which we stand today is full of promise and danger. Our nation will either move forward toward unity and widely shared prosperity, or it will move apart. It's advisable to those in government and those in authority to know that the test of our progress is not whether we add more to those who already have abundance. No, 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 no. It is if we provide enough for those who have too little. Right now, the provision, excruciating want, is the root cause of banditry, kidnapping, for ransom, and other criminal enterprises plaguing our nation. The question we need to ask our leaders and dealers is, which one do they prefer? Unity and prosperity or secession and disintegration? Because both are staring us in the face right now. Unity and prosperity or secession and disintegration? Let me ask you as God's saints, sent to execute the judgment that is written, which one do you prefer today on behalf of the East, on behalf of the West, on behalf of the North, on behalf of the South, on behalf of a united... Which one do you prefer? I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Unity and prosperity. Then be seated. 
Eternal truth number three. Eternal truth and prosperity. If those who are in authority today cannot deliver unity and prosperity, then we have the mandate of Jehovah to declare a change of God. If they will not repent, if they will not seek the face of the Lord, if they will not seek wisdom from those who have them, if they become hardened, then we have God-given right and mandate and authority to declare a change of God. For some time now, I've repeatedly mentioned to you that the change that this nation needs will happen before 2023. How many of you are witnesses that have said that to you? I specifically mentioned also that there will be a change of God in 2021. Do you remember that? I want you to please note that a change of God does not mean a change of allegiance. Aha. Uh -huh. Now you are looking at me and say, does he want to confuse us? No. A change of God is not a change of allegiance. Are you ready for this? What's eternal truth number one? Where the prince of peace does not reign, there cannot be peace. What's eternal truth number two? Error breeds terror. Eternal truth number three. If those who are in charge of your nation, of your government, of your business, of your company, of your corporation, of the church of the Lord, if they are not men that will spread peace and prosperity, like Philip who spread joy in Samaria, God will begin to quench the lamp of the wicked. There will be a change of God. But a change of God is not a change of allegiance. I'm taking you down memory lane, down in history, to a time in Israel when the nation of Israel demanded for a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, this is very interesting. It sobers me up to know that God rules in the affairs of men and gives it to whosoever he wills. 1 Samuel 8, now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Huh. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after this honest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. In the name of Jesus, everyone in the cabinet of President Muhammad Buhari Everyone around him as SAA, as whatever name, by whatever designation, who have been perverting justice and taking bribes, your days are numbered. In the name of Jesus. The land will not just open his mouth and swallow you, it will vomit you. God will expose all the stealing that is going on. No matter by who. Whether in the military, whether in the civil service, whether in the judiciary, whether in the legislature, in the mighty name of Jesus, every one of you perverting justice and taking bribes and driving us backwards and now forward, this land will vomit you. This land will vomit you. This land will vomit you. In Jesus' mighty name. Please be seated. I want you to know that when Israel demanded for a king, then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. This was not a change of God. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, listen to it. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people. In all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. This was not a change of God. This is a change of allegiance. We must be playing. We must make ourselves clear. Because I know you Nigerians. The moment you can look back in our history, the moment someone is oppressing us, and he's overthrown, we rejoice. Shagari was corrupt. Buhari came. 
and began to put people in jail. And said, well, look, this is, this is your asset that we have found. But this is your salary. This is the number of years you served. How did you come by this? In those days, uh, unlike in the law, a uh, rule of law, uh, an accused person is presumed innocent until the contrary is proved. Buhari's an idea against the regime was an accused person is presumed guilty until the contrary is proved. And he lampooned them and threw them into jail. <laughs> 120 years, 100 years. And then he himself was overthrown and put in jail. And all the money he collected from those people were returned to him by those who overthrew them. They were returned to them. And what was Nigerians doing? Laughing. God has sent away our enemy. Then he went through three cycles of election and imagine again. Okay. Every coup the time Nigeria has given you joy. If anything happens now, you'll be dancing on the street. Because that's who we are. Our memory is fickle. We don't think deep. We do not know the difference between a change of God and a change of allegiance. Israel came to demand that God should stop ruling over them. In his mercy, God spoke to Israel through Samuel. Said, Protest solemnly to them what manner of king they are going to have how he will oppress them, how he will take their vineyard, how he will turn their sons and daughters into this and that. Samuel protested solemnly. They said, nevertheless, they got king. When I perceived what was coming upon this nation, did I not cry out? Did you listen? There's no name they've not called. But let's settle some things today. Because I heard a question and answer time yesterday with the PTB4 group in, in Canada and in the diaspora. They asked me a question. And others have asked me also. Is it not you that brought Buhari into power? <laughs> Hello? I can see your face. <laughs> yes. But you know he's running it. You persuaded us to follow him. And now we are in trouble. You know, I'm so powerful that all by myself, I imposed him on you. But that's not the issue. I'm not going to hide under the umbrella of one finger that I did not declare that this is the way to go. I did. But who told Samuel to anoint Saul? Who brought Samuel who brought Saul to Samuel? God. Who said to Samuel, by this time tomorrow, I'm bringing to you one who will be captain over my people. Oh. So, we should all kill Samuel. Say with me, God rules in the affairs of men. He gives it to whosoever he wills. Even the basis of men. In every generation, in every dispensation, God knows what he's doing. He knows what will come first, what will come later. In every nation, go look. Whoever developed and made it, just as the last Adam came after the first Adam and the second man came after the first man, in like manner, souls must go before David's. Was Saul a bad man? He was a humble man. When Samuel said to him, the delight of God is upon you, he said, no, no, no. My family is the least. 
We are so least we can no. He said, that's what God had said. And I've kept this sacrifice apart from you yesterday. You eat with me, and tomorrow I will tell you. By the way, God designed how you will get to me by hiding the donkeys. The donkeys have been found so that you can get here. And the following day, he anointed him. Then he brought him before the people. And it was the people that said, long live the king. Then they blamed Samuel. They demanded a change of allegiance. They demanded, they, they gave the allegiance to a king instead of to God. And God said, okay, here is what you want. Enjoy it. But the man that God used to make it happen is the one they will kill. Don't forget this ever. It wasn't the army of Saul or his weapons of war that kept the enemy at bay. I can show you in split second. It was the presence of Samuel in Israel. He said, I will never stop from praying for you. If we withdraw his prayer, the enemy will invade the land. He was in sorrow. He was in pain. And before you start saying your abracadabra, can you read your Bible and find eternal truth that when Saul rebelled against God, when Saul stopped doing God's will, it was the same Samuel God sent to the house of Jesse. And before sending him there in chapter 13 and in chapter 15, it was the same Samuel God said, God has rejected your kingdom. It was the same Samuel that announces removal. All these untutored, puppet prophets who do not know what God is doing, what he's saying. They blame what they don't understand. They call people names. Do you understand me? For as long as I'm in the epicenter of God's will and you are in the epicenter of God's will, bad things may happen left, right, and center, but all things will work for a good of those who love the Lord and who are they called according to his purpose. Do you understand me? A change of allegiance is not the same thing as a change of God. <laughs> Don't confuse both. But the grace of the living God in this house, we will serve no other God but the living God. Say with me, this God, this God. is our God, our God. forever. He will be our guide Amen. even unto death in Jesus' mighty name. After our allegiance to God, and that's where you have to really give God some kudos and praise him for my life and for the life of many others who know how to say no. Our allegiance must be to our nation and not to Mr. President. If it does not represent God to us, our allegiance must be to our God and our nation. If a minister is not representing God to us, our allegiance can be to them. Our allegiance can only be to them if their allegiance is to the constitution of the land and they are ruling according to law, not according to might. Are you with me? Yes, oh, may God raise zealous men, patriotic men and women in Nigeria yes. in the mighty name of Jesus. Can I hear a good amen? amen? Eternal truth number four, I'd already mentioned it, but I'll, I'll repeat it. God rules in the affairs of men. He gives it to whosoever he wills. A question that I want to ask here. Did God know that Israel would demand for a king? Or it happened to him suddenly? It was when they demanded that he knew they would ask. No. He told Moses in Deuteronomy 17 from verse 14 to 20. He said, a time we come when they get to the land and they would demand for a king and say, make us a king like other nations. And then gave them what and what manner of king they should have. Mm. I cannot but pause and sympathize with those who criticize us endlessly on social media. As he, as I said, we single-handedly imposed Buari on you. I was his running mate in 2011. I wasn't there in 2015. I wasn't there in 2019. But I kept on supporting to the best of my ability doing all the rights that I think are necessary, trying to point out the way my own way. But if it's not going that way, that does not make me an enemy of Buari. Any friendship that ended never started. My duty is to pray. My duty is to listen. And from time to time, either I'm sent for or I book appointment to go see Mr. President and say, Sir, 
I remain in the office of the friend of the president. If things are going well, I'll tell you. If they're not going well, I'll let you know. And let God judge me by what I've done in this nation. I mean, those who criticize me unduly be forgiven because they have dug their own grave. They are just about to enter. <sighs> Here is my final submission because of time today. I can't go deep as I want to go deep. I was going to show you the coronation of Saul. What Samuel said to the people that you have sinned against the Lord. And I will let you know that you have sinned against the Lord. It will turn down. Is it yet harvest time? It will turn down rain. And rain came and they fell down. They said we have sinned against God. In demanding for a king. The whole nation repented. God has a way of bringing people back to him. And then he said I will never stop praying for you. All his days, the Philistines could not come. In fact, they restored all the land they took. See, by the time we come next Sunday, you will understand why we are throwing, uh, making peace to people today because it will be bloody next Sunday. Do you understand? It's going to be extremely bloody. You will see the anger of God walking naked in certain places. You understand me? Many that you think are powerful alive today will be history by next Sunday. Amen. By the time we gather to pray, God will pluck them out and blow out the alarm. If the Lord had sent me, it will happen. If I had gone on a frolic of my own, nothing will happen. Do you understand this? How close with this? Eternal truth number five. Wherever God cannot rule, he will overrule. Wherever God cannot rule, he will overrule. For the sake of those in government and those of you listening to me today, it may be pertinent to catalog the blunders of King Saul that warranted his removal and the change of guards. Hopefully lessons can be learned and genuine repentance can follow. Number one, Saul rebelled against God and was incorrigibly stubborn. Incorrigibly stubborn. You can correct him. He was so stubborn. He was so adamant. According to Prophet Samuel, Saul's stubbornness and rebellion equal idolatry and witchcraft. The moment a leader is stubborn and will not listen to counsel, he does not know he had dipped himself into idolatry and witchcraft and judgment will come. Was God delight in the offering of rams or the bleaching of sheep? To obey is better than sacrifice and to akin than the father of rams. Number two. Saul envied those sent to help him and sought to kill those who are better than him. He did not understand that success without succession is failure. When leaders begin to show no interest in after they leave past, something is wrong. We're not asking anyone to impose anybody on anyone or the nation. No, but you must be interested in who succeeds you. David said, I'm so glad that my son is sitting on my throne while I'm still here. Go read your Bible very well. When he sat on that throne, he sat as chief governor and not as king. Because two kings are not being a terrain. He became full king after his father died. Go check First Chronicles and First Kings, you'll find it there. He sat as chief governor. But he was the one administering everything while his father was alive. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? <laughs> He began to look for those who should succeed him. The moment they sang, Saul has killed his thousand, David is ten thousand. He did not understand that one of you shall chase his thousand and two of you shall chase ten thousand. He should have recognized God brought this person to help. But rather than accommodating the person, they're giving cool shoulder here, cool shoulder there, and began to pursue him. You are wasting your time. Your time is up. You don't know why the time is up? How long did Jesus live in Bethlehem? I can't hear you. Yes. How many years is left for Buhari's administration? Yes. He either makes appropriate decisions and do what is needful now, or he will live to regret. Do you understand me? I don't mean words. I do not say things in public that I could not say in private. Are you listening to me? Within two years, things will change in this country I announce to you, right now in 2021, there will be a change of God. Yeah. 
I've told you before, the president will not die. The vice president will not die. I'm not praying for anybody to die. But there will be a change of God. Beginning from now, in the name of Jesus Christ. He deployed state apparatus to kill David. Sent soldiers after him to kill him in his house. He sent his wife against him, turned his wife against him. And he had to flee to distant land. Look at how many people can return home because of unrest, because of instability. Look at how foreign direct investment is flying away from our nation instead of flying in. Shall we continue to fold our arms and say this continue forever? Now we are talking, we are asking them to come, to come, to come to where? Who's going to put money in the midst of chaos? That's Joseph. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> Listen to me. In the mighty name of Jesus, King Saul also commanded that priests be killed. He wiped out an entire village of priests. He sent Doeg the Edomite to do the job. Do you understand me? He was shedding blood upon blood. Listen. Do you know all that didn't move God against Saul? He had already removed him. Do you know how long Saul ruled for? 40 years. 40. 40 whole years. Do you know how long David lived for? Ruled for? 40 years also. The king that reigns and there's peace and prosperity and increase has a name. Want to make a name for yourself? This is not the time to shed innocent blood. This is not the time to dabble into the occult. It was when Saul dabbled into the occult, consulting mediums, necromancy in the house of the witch of Endor. It was after he had participated in the communion of devils that God slew him. God killed him literally. And God said, I did so because rather than seeking me, you are seeking medium. Did he try to seek God? Yes. God did not answer by vision, by Urim, or by prophet. By the time God wants to make you man, not the gods, you will not see anyone wanting you anymore. And whether you like it or not, you will leave that position. Hey, Brothers and sisters, the last boss of degradation or the last boss stop to degradation is when men began to justify the things they once condemned. When, the, when Saul got to the house of the witch of Endor, he said, don't kill me. Don't expose my life to danger. Don't you know that Saul has banished spiritists in the land? He said, Not, as the Lord lives, that was what he said, nothing will happen to you. And God allowed him to consult. It was after he finished consulting that God slew him. Judgment fell, befell Saul after he consulted the witch of Endor. And that same judgment awaits those of you in government, consulting mediums, voodoo priests, and using occultic power to bring darkness into our land. Your days are over in the name of Jesus. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 1 to 14. First Chronicles 10, 1 to 14. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gibor. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishra and Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it. Let the uncircumcised men come and abuse me. Why well, you circumcise yourself? But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. He committed suicide. Is that it? <laughs> and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died. <laughs> so Saul and his three sons died, and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that they had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and fled. 
Then the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons falling on Mangilboa. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among the people. Here we go. Then they put his armor where? In the temple of their gods and did what with it? And fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. And when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son, and they brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for what? For his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he, who is he? He killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of David. That's a change of God. Do you understand me? It's not change of allegiance, it's change of God. I want you to stand to your feet. Every leader, no matter where they are, minister, whoever it is, whatever position that is using all kinds of occultic activities, all kinds of voodoo, all kinds of blood sacrifice in order to retain power in this nation or in order to access power right now we declare the judgment that is written in the mighty name of Jesus. Your time is up. Your days are over. Except you repent. Except you repent and cry for help. The blood you have shed is crying from the ground like the blood of Abel. Hey, the chief of Amistad did not die alone. It, 10 people died with him or 11 people died with him in one day. We are wasting life. We are killing people. Occultic activities had permeated this land. Today, in the name of Jesus, not only they, even their voodoo priests will perish with them. In the mighty name of Jesus, there is still hope for them. If they can just repent and surrender their lives to Jesus, he will forgive them. He will heal them. He will heal their families. But without genuine repentance from demonic activities that have plagued this nation, that have turned this country into a bloodbath that has brought all kinds of things, banditry, kidnapping, terrorism into our land, we call it enough today in the name of Jesus. We put pay to the activities. Oh God, remember what you did in times of old, how you killed Saul, for consulting a witch, every voodoo priest, every miracle, everyone misdirecting our leaders in this nation, they and them. The ground is opening to swallow you up in the mighty name of Jesus. Nigeria will flourish again. Nigeria will be saved. Nigeria will be changed. Nigeria will become great in my lifetime. In Jesus' name. This is the final verdict of Jehovah for every soul that turn allegiance from him to themselves. Hosea chapter number 13 verse number 9. Hosea 13 verse number 9. I'll read up to verse 11 and I take my seat. Oh Israel, you are destroyed by your help is from me. I will be your king. Where is any other that he may serve you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. May God's mercy be upon you.